and the title of the uh, piece or the headline is Germany and the Armenian Massacres, but actually it's also the Greek Massacres. The character and extent of Germany's... Close to the mic. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now better? Yes, yes I'm sorry, I didn't realize that. Um, the character and extent of Germany's relation to the massacre of Armenians are impressively indicated in the memoirs of Mr. Henry Morgenthau, the American ambassador at Constantinople for some years prior uh, to February 1916, when he resigned and returned to Washington. Still more brutally implacable towards the Armenians was the German naval attaché in Constantinople, Herr Humann, a personal emissary of the Kaiser. In reply to our American protest, Human said the Turks had to protect themselves, and from that point of view, they were entirely justified in treating the Armenians as if they, as they were doing. Various attempts were made to prevent Mr. Morgenthau publishing particulars of the crimes. While his son, Henry Morgenthau, Jr., was on a visit to the Gallipoli Peninsula, General Lehman von Sanders, the German commander, remarked to him, your father is making a great mistake in giving out the facts about what the Turks are doing to the Armenians. That really is not his business. A German Jew from Berlin, Dr. Nussuk, apparently on behalf of the embassy, waited twice on, on the minister and advised him that his protest would be useless and that the Turkish government was contemplating of asking for his recall. He added, all of us Jews are proud of what you, a Jew, have done, and we would hate to see your career end disastrously. Morgenthau retorted that he could think no greater honor than to be sacrificed because he, a Jew, had been exerting all his powers to save the lives of hundreds of thousands of Christians. God bless him. I read his books. He's a great writer. Uh, I uh, I can only go on about how much I admire him, but I'll have to stop. Mr. Morgenthau observes that when Turkey decided on the deportation and massacre of her sub subject peoples, especially the Armenians and Greeks, she signed her own economic death warrant. These were people who controlled their industries and her finance and developed her agriculture and material consequences of this great national crime began to, e to be apparent, uh, everywhere apparent, as the Armenians and Greeks were the greatest taxpayers and their annihilation greatly, re greatly reduced the state revenues and the fact that practically all Turkish ports were blockaded, shut off customs um, collections. Regarding Germany's, and I, I'm not going to keep going, but I want to get to this other part that I must tell you. Uh, on and on, and then we get to the part that I want you to know about. In order to entice the Turks to, not that they needed to, enticement to kill us, but uh, they were being enticed nevertheless because they were giving them bullets which they didn't have and now they had bullets, and now they had uniforms, and now they had officer training, thanks to the Germans at, and during the First World War. He said, German success, and that it therefore had been necessary to remove them, just like so much useless lumber. Viladi elnika a achristi xilia etsi masihane ipolodisi. Keti, oti kanete kanete in achristi xilia. Oh, sorry, I forget I have a microphone. Ninautora ya ti peo yermanos estus turcus. Hetusipe namas teorune os ax achisti xilia. Geladin otika mas namas diarisun e deni kaki nami fobaste. Kani te oti prepi na 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 xepihume namas namas diarisun. Many times they tell us that 
after all, they had to beat us up because we were having, we were doing bad things to them. Not so. Not according to Dr. Usher, who is an American physician and a missionary. And he wrote in his book, he said, up to now, Turkish policy deliberately degrades the veracity of the white eyewitness U.S. government officials, missionaries, educators, and um, physicians, whose books remain as constant reminders of the facts of the Christian Holocaust. Oh, no, uh, sorry, that was not the part I wanted to tell you. Excuse me. Uh, he spoke about, I don't know why I can't find it now. He spoke about that, uh, that they, they would purposely incite, that was the word he used, they would purposely incite us so that we would retaliate. And then once we would retaliate, then we'd say, see, they did that. That's why we did this to them. But it was all by design. And one of the things I can't imagine living in the community or wherever it is, and they're after us now, and one of the things they're doing is they're shouting with their swords and coming through the streets or whatever it is that they're coming to, and they're yelling at the top of their lungs, their wives shall be widows and their children orphans. <coughs> Kill all the orphans. Turkey for the Turks only. That was written by him. Uh, and then there's one uh, that I read that was so difficult This uh, when I typed it. The report, it was seven pages long by Albert McKenzie that I couldn't keep my eyes dry. I was crying and drying and, and typing and going like this. I'll just read you the one part that really, you see pictures of the people who are walking and they call them deportations. But you don't know, that wasn't really, that was a death march. But we still don't know what a death march is. Here's a, a, one example. Their purpose was to sell it at from one to, the, uh, to three uh, liras a cup. I mean, I'm sorry, I have to go over for Uh-huh. For another five days, they did not have a morsel of bread nor a drop of water. They were scorched to death by thirst. Hundreds upon hundreds fell dead on the way. Their tongues were turned into charcoal. And when, at the end of five days, they reached a fountain, the whole convoy forbade them to take a single, single drop of water. Their purpose was to sell it at the uh, at the water from getting uh, sell sell it at oh, from one to three liras the cup and sometimes they actually withheld the water after getting the money. At another place where they were there were wells, some women threw themselves into them, and there was no rope or pail to draw up the water. These women were drowned, and in spite of all that. The rest of the uh, that the rest of the people drank from that well, the dead bodies still remaining there and stinking in the water. Sometimes, when the wells were shallow and the women could go down into them and come out again, the other people would rush to lick, suck their wet, dirty clothes in an effort to quench their thirst. I brought with me a loose leaf book, which I'm also going to donate. I put this together uh, several years ago when I realized the one thing uh, that we suffer from is our stories have not been told. The best, best teaching tool that there is is movies. Uh, we've seen so many films about the Jewish Holocaust and maybe, maybe 20 about us. Well, I collected all, as many as I could at the time, but I'm sure there's more. But these are all m movies about the Jewish Holocaust. Okay? I hope someday we can start doing our job. I know they don't let us do it, but maybe we can start working on that. So this is for you. Thank you. And I'm almost finished now. Oh, George Horton was a great man 
who was the uh, Consul General of Smyrna for 30 years. And I since became his, again, I, I get into things, I became his daughter's friend, Nancy Horton. She's now in her high 90s, God bless her. And she told me a few things that bothered me. And, uh, um, and some of them I was even afraid to say out loud because I don't want to bring danger to her. But I think by now they have to leave her alone, I hope. But uh, her, I did learn that her father was a remarkable man. He, wrote, he spoke many languages and he wrote many books and a lot of his books were reviewed by the New York Times. And yet, when The Blight of Asia was written, which was the story of what he saw with his own eyes in, in Smyrna, his book was not reviewed. That's important to know, back to the before the silence aspect of things. We, it was by design we weren't supposed to know. And, uh, and also, the Blight of Asia was not allowed to be printed in Greece for many years. So um, that's, and then also, thank you again. Yeah. I hope I haven't been too quiet, but, uh, Oh, Nancy told me that, that Smyrna was so highly considered by, by diplomats that they preferred, when they had a, a place of choice to serve, they, they chose number one was Vienna. Their second choice of city was Smyrna. And the third was Paris, not the other way around. So that's how important uh, Smyrna was. She also uh, was, she told me whenever she spoke publicly, she was warned by the Turks never to use the word massacre. Well, you know, the person who won her legal case started going through the book, her father's book, and I discovered that he, dis he used, her father used the word massacre a hundred times. Um, fire, 75 times. Death, four times. Murder, 35 times. Destruction, 33 times. Extermination, 32 times. Loot, 20 times. Atrocity, 18 times. Rob, 18 times. Outrage, 13 times. Plunder, 10 times. Savage, 8 times. Torture, 8 times. Oh, and even the word rape, 7 times. Slaughter, 4 times. And one of, uh, uh, and you probably know all this already, but just in case you don't, in his book he talks about his wonderful friend, uh, he, uh, Archbishop Chrysostomos. And he quotes him because he said to, he wanted to save him, and he, wouldn't, he didn't want to be saved. He said he had to be there. And he said to me, this is what Chrysostomos said to George Horton, I am a shepherd and must stay with my flock. He died a martyr and deserves the highest honors in the bestowal of the Greek government. He, me he merits the respect of all men and women to, to whom courage in the face of horrible death makes an appeal. And one of the quotations I have by George Horton that I stings me is when he wrote, one of the keenest impressions I, when I was brought away, with, that I, which I brought away with me from Smyrna was a feeling of shame that I belong to the human race. And Winston Churchill said, Kemal celebrated his triumph by transforming Smyrna into ashes and by slaughtering the whole of the indigenous Christian population. And then my, uh, in the meantime, I have become very enamored by two women who wrote remarkable books. They were two doctors. Back then, when a woman was a doctor, which already was an accomplishment, she wasn't given a chance to show her stuff in this country. She had to go overseas. And therefore, they were lucky over there that they had these two remarkable women. Dr. Lovejoy wrote in her book, and her book was Certain Samaritans. I, I don't think it's available still as a book to buy. I was able to get hold of it, but it's 
good luck. Pain, anguish, fear, fright, despair, and that dumb endurance beyond despair cannot be expressed in words. Fortunately, there seems to be a point at which human beings become incapable of further suffering, a point where reason and sensation fail and faith cooperating with the instincts of self-preservation and race preservation take control, releasing subhuman and superhuman reservoirs of strength and endurance which are not called upon under civilized conditions of life. And uh, I'm cutting it short. Oh, and the last one, but not least. This is by the other doctor, Dr. Mabel Elliott, who again writes magnificently, and her book was called Beginning at Ararat. And she evidently was in a place where she was called to, to speak to these young girls who were uh, found, who had escaped from a harem. Harems didn't only belong to the uh, sultans, they also belonged to wealthy Turks. And these poor girls managed to escape with their lives, and, when they, and they were brought to her. And then one by one, being a good doctor, she let them speak to her. And first when she would speak, they would be very quiet, quiet. And then finally, everything just exploded in them. But this one story that I have to share with you uh, stunned me. Then there was another girl whose story had a touch of the incredibly fantastic. With eyelids closed, she was the most beautiful girl I had seen among people renowned for feminine beauty. What a wonderful way to describe somebody. Her features were like those preserved for us from antiquity by the chisels of great artists. Her skin was like that of a child, and her body was a rhythm of line. But when she opened her eyes, it became painful to look at her. One eyeball swung outward in its socket so grotesquely that one thought of a gargoyle. Her story was the was the un, was the usual one. During the deportations, she had been sold to a Turkish house. There she had been rebellious, violent, and incorrigible. She said, my eyes were perfectly straight, but they took me to a hospital and had this done to me. And she pointed to the crooked eye. Why resort to an infinitely delicate operation? It, it is my question. I cannot understand. This is a doctor now writing this. I cannot answer a question for whose answer is so deep in Turkish character that only a Turkish